welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. We've stumbled upon some new signature models, one of them that is completely shocking. So today we're going to talk about this guy again, Gene Simmons. Earlier this year they announced the new Thunderbird basses. They have one right here that's more of like a silver theme, they got some nice binding going on, kind of an interesting Gibson headstock to them. And then they've got a matching red one where you get the matching pick guards, you get the red binding, pretty much the same base, except for it's a different color. However, in Bass Magazine, he elaborated a little bit more on what we can expect. So first off, word on the street, we're not even going to see these bases be available till way later in this year. It wouldn't even surprise me if they don't come out till 2022. However, right here, it says they're also going to be doing a Flying V base. And I thought that was interesting because Cesar is always posting these uh, Flying V bases right here. And I was wondering who that was alluding to. I was always thinking, oh, that's Adam Jones. Maybe they'll like give a signature tool Flying V base. No, I think Cesar purchased this one because they're kind of doing some research behind the Flying V base. It's a model that Gibson doesn't really do a lot of. I believe they first came about in the 80s. And that's what this one is. This is just part of his own personal collection. It's not like they're going to do a signature silver burst one, nor does it mean that they're actually going to put these things in production just because he owns them and posts them on his own personal page. I believe the last time they did them at all was about 10 years ago. You can see they did a satin version and you know these things they just don't look all that cool to me. But when you go for the full vintage ones that have the black pick guards, that looks pretty stellar. And here's a rare blue one. I don't think I've ever seen one in that particular finish. Needless to say though, I think we're desperately due for a cool version of one of these. And judging by the way that the Thunderbirds look, I've got high hopes for the Flying V base. But here is another big thing. All of the instruments will be available in left hand as well because he feels that's an underserved area. You know, if you're a lefty or bassist right now, you're probably rejoicing. But even lefty guitar players, listen to this. They're also going to be doing different variations, like guitar versions, that are going to sound as good as anything. <laughs> now when he says guitar versions, is he saying like an actual guitar version of this bass? So are we going to get legitimate Firebirds that look like this? If so, I am pumped for that. I think this red one looks particularly nice, but to get that in a six string format, it fits my show a little bit better. We would definitely be seeing that one featured. And then I would probably just uh, feature the silver bass. But who knows if those are going to come out at the same time as these. Like did Gibson tell us about these two bases earlier and then they're going to surprise us with all this other stuff towards the end of the year. Or are we going to be waiting years for this? We don't know at this point in time. But what got me excited as you know more of a collector rare guitar guy is there's also going to be a limited number of collectors items with an S. So plural. And then he rattles off a guitar bass double neck. Excuse me? <laughs> A guitar bass double neck? That means we're talking something like this. Not like the slash double neck. Usually when somebody thinks a double neck Gibson, they're thinking of the EDS 1275. That's a 12 string and a 6 string guitar blended together. However, this is completely game changing simply because I do not believe Gibson has ever, ever actually made a production run of these. Now I get it, it's gonna be limited edition, probably like 25, 50 pieces, who knows? Maybe a little bit more than that. But despite these things existing, I mean, clearly here we can see one from the 60s, they were normally a custom order of some sort. They didn't just make a production run of them to sell them. So that is really exciting to me because we have not had that in a long time. It might not be the most practical for the average Joe players, but the guys that are really musical, they can make some great use out of having a bass and a guitar on the same instrument. Now, will he be reissuing the fuzz tone version? Yeah, probably not, but I can only find so many photos of these. So I'll be really interested to see what color and what specs we have going on there. Because when this magazine asked him, hey, what kind of specs we got going on? What kind of pickups? He goes, I have no idea. And then he goes on this great story where he says he drives his truck because he knows how to drive it. He doesn't care about the innards. He takes it to a mechanic or somebody that knows how to get it to do the sound that he wants. So for most of his signature guitars, I think he's just, you know, leaving it up to Gibson to create something that he likes as far as the tone goes. <laughs> so who's to say Gibson won't throw a fuzz tone in it just for fun? You know, I'm not even sure if Gibson would build you 
a double neck bass and electric guitar through the made to measure program. I haven't tested that, but that is certainly exciting that within the next year or two, we might actually see something like that because a famous artist asked for it. Because this vintage original 1968 costs $58,000, they're rare. And it's known as the EBS 1250. If Gibson's gonna start building stuff like this though, I want a signature Elvis double neck. <laughs> I mean, look at this one. That's not a four string bass. That is a six string bass with a six string guitar. I love that one. But we can go on and on about double necks for days. Like the true vintage vintage ones before they switched over to the more SG style body. I mean, here's what this one looks like. Wouldn't that be cool to have the hollow body version? What I like about this one is the necks are relatively the same size, despite one being a bass and one being a guitar. Who knows, he might even have it go the other way, have guitar up front and the bass down there since that's where he's used to playing it at. But the old vintage double necks are certainly interesting guitars. Gene's pretty confident that everybody's going to want that one. I don't know about everybody, and they're probably gonna be like $20,000 in super limited edition, but if that's what he's doing for just one of these collector's items, I'm excited to see what else he might have him do. He's certainly spicing up the Gibson bass lineup. Speaking of spicing things up, you guys remember the Basket Case Les Paul special? If you haven't watched it before, just search Trogley Basket Case on YouTube and you'll find these. It was mainly a three-part series where I found a badly mutilated vintage Les Paul special. We're talking one of the 70s versions. Somebody had sanded down the back, they just... They went way too far, as you could tell there. But I wanted to see if you could string it up and play it as is. But then I thought, hey, maybe I could send this to somebody to do a proper restoration on it. So I eventually sent it off to a guy three years ago now. And by sent it off, I mean I sold it to him. And he had a little blog where he was kind of going through and restoring it. But then I saw this listing on Reverb a couple of nights ago. And it's like, is that? Yep, that, that's probably my guitar, my old guitar. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like he is going to complete the project, but he at least started working on it. You can tell it's the same guitar because, you know, he tells you in the description, but you've got the characteristic little break mark right there. It's beautifully aged. It's definitely been handled a little bit since I last cleaned it, but it looks like he's taken the fretboard out and then routed this channel larger in order to install another truss rod and kind of build up the neck or something like that. But as far as the back of the instrument, it looks like it's pretty much the same as when I had gotten it, except for he kind of chipped away this area. Apparently this was just like wood filler plaster that somebody had done there because you know they sanded too much and they wanted some sort of a cavity. So when I had it, th this was like halfway covered up so you couldn't see through the entire guitar. But unfortunately this one is you know, still needing repair. So if somebody wants to buy it, make a YouTube series out of it, there's definitely people following the story. I would say at least 20, 30,000 people. So 500 bucks is a little bit expensive for this, but if you need content on your channel, hey, you might go for it. If I had the woodworking skills to make it something, yeah, I'd probably do it, but I don't. And it would cost way too much to hire somebody to do this. This would be a great test for the Gibson restoration department. <laughs> No, oh, I could probably buy like six other guitars with the same amount of money. Next, let's revisit a topic that we briefly talked about yesterday. Jared James Nichols' new gold top. So the Les Paul Forum, you can follow him on Instagram. He's also the guy that runs the Les Paul Forum. So you can check that out too. He mentioned something on here. He said, look very closely on this guitar. This was never a trapeze tailpiece. Again, we're talking about this. This is what that guitar supposedly originally looked like. But he brought up, if we really zoom in here, you can actually see the shadows of what was originally on this. I never even thought to look this far because I just saw this and was like, okay, yeah, that seems right for the trapeze style. But I didn't bother to look here. This might have been one of the earlier prototype Les Pauls. We already know it's an early one because of the diagonal screws, but the fact that this had a trapeze style tailpiece and like a floating bridge look makes things kind of interesting. So, so here's Les Paul himself and Mary Ford, and you can see what some of the early prototypes looked like. Now, apparently they didn't come from the factory looking like this. They did a whole bunch of wang jangling and modifications themselves as they were trying to make it the best guitar for them. But you can see what we're talking about here, the trapeze style, and then you've got a bridge underneath her hand right there. 
And in this photo, you've got a leg over what we want to see as well. <laughs> However, it's not one of these guitars, though. That has been confirmed by some reputable people within the comment section. But it is possible that, you know, Les and Mary might have actually seen this guitar at one point in time. So I think Jared has stumbled upon a real winner. And now, how is he going to restore it? Is he actually going to do it up like the old one? Because last time I was questioning, is he going to do the rap tail? But now he almost has to go back to the trapeze style. If anything, I want Gibson to do a custom limited edition version of this guitar. Maybe do a version that's just the regular like R2 style, but they do the bridge pickup screws and do the unbound fretboard. I think that would be cool. And then do like a highly collector limited edition release that has the chicken head knob on it. You know, pretty much an exact replica of this guitar, which apparently doesn't even look like this anymore. It's a completely different color. Because they've done a signature Mary Ford Les Paul Gold Top before, back in 97. This is a model I'd really like to review because I love the pick guard and the arm guard on it. Very 50s vintage. So that makes me even more excited for that restoration project. Speaking of original gold tops, I just happened to see this listing. It's a late 60s, supposed late 60s Les Paul case. It seems about right, but it's got kind of a rare finish interior. But I'm flipping through these photos and lo and behold, take a look at that. We've got another early 52 like that maybe originally came like this. It's probably been modified. I don't know the story. This is not actually for sale. This just happened to be in this listing that I found, but somebody's stripped off the gold finish and I think it looks quite handsome. It's nice. I would buy that guitar just like that. Despite not having the gold finish, I think that natural maple wood grain looks pretty nice. It's not a hundred million pieces. It almost looks like one piece. There's only one photo, so we can't accurately judge that but somebody's definitely added an ABR1 bridge to it. But that probably started just like Jared's old one. And that just happened to be a, a chance listing here that I happened to click on this one and see that. So that's a cool one. I don't think he wants to sell it though, so don't bug him about it. And since we're talking about the 50s, I thought we'd check this guy out, a 295. I always love seeing these things in just absolutely beat condition. Now, unfortunately, this one, it just looks like it it wasn't taken care of, so it's not my favorite looking one. But when you find one that's been played and then you play them, you know why people played these things. But this one's been given the Scotty Moore tribute. One of these days I need to get around to reviewing my Scotty Moore signature ES295. But yeah, this one looks like it was left somewhere hot and the paint started to just blister off of it because a lot of this does not look like play wear to me. But it definitely had some humidity going on as well. Maybe it was in a fire, who knows? but it does look like it saw some playtime and somebody's put a new nut on it. But the action, despite everything, actually looks pretty darn good for one of these. Looks like a good setup to me. But how much do they want for this really checked up 295? We're at $6,995. I think that's a bit extreme for the condition that this one's in, but we'll see if somebody wants to pay it. And lastly today, we'll skip to the late 90s with a beautiful Les Paul Elegant. Now, I've done reviews on the Elegants if you want to learn more about them, but take a look at that quilt top. That is gorgeous. You've got that dark ambered hue. I'm sure some of this is just the nice photography, but you can also tell this is a quilt top that really will come to life in person, and it matches great with the abalone inlays, ebony fretboard on these, but the fun is not done yet. We're not talking about the headstock today. We're not necessarily even talking about the inlays, despite them looking really great. Really, really great. We're talking about the back. Now, a lot of these elegants from the late 90s will have great backs, but to have a matching crazily quilted mahogany body with a massively quilted maple top, that's kind of cool. Especially the fact that I know whenever you get a body that looks like this, they're generally ridiculously heavy, but the elegants, they chamber them out. So knowing that you just have all these beautifully figured woods on this thing, and it's probably not going to be a boat anchor, but feel like a regular Les Paul, this one has me really excited. And they're only asking 3,700 bucks. Considering the condition, considering the top and the back, I would say that's within fair territory. Normally an elegant will sell between, you know, 28 to 35. Now, if you get a special color, that'll fluctuate upwards, but this one, fairly common color, but awesome wood grain. I think somebody should pick this thing up. I'm guessing 
he's semi what firm on the price judging by the fact that he's had eight offers though all right troglodytes thank you for tuning in today don't forget to like comment and subscribe and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode take care